The Lord gave the word. The Lord gave the word, and great was the company of those who proclaimed it. Welcome this morning to this hour set apart for our worshiping community, students, faculty, and staff here in the ATO Chapel and online. We are led in worship today by Mark DeWall, a five-year MDiv student, and Aaron Katner, uh, an undergraduate worship major, leading our music, by Dr. Stephen Bryan, Associate Professor of New Testament, uh, praying and uh, sending us forth with a good word from God at the end of our hour. Today we begin the 42nd Annual Ram Lectures on Preaching and welcome our Ram Lecturer, Dr. Ami Lee. Dr. Lee will be introduced more fully by Dr. Bill Donahue just before she speaks this morning. I want to remind us that all of are invited to a free lunch following today, including question and answer time with Dr. Lee in Hinkson Hall. Uh, begins at noon. And for those of you who are online, that uh, session will also be uh, online. So we invite you to stay with us and enjoy that time. And now let us praise God in the congregation. Praise the Lord in this assembly. Sing to God, O kingdoms of the earth. Sing praise to the Lord. Lord, you ride the ancient skies above, and you thunder with a mighty voice. We proclaim your power as we see it in the skies and as we experience in the sanctuary where you are preached today. Give, we ask, power and strength to your people. Praise be to God. Amen. Would you please stand with us as we worship our great king this morning?
Please be seated. Well, welcome. It's good to have you with us for the 2021 ROM Lectures on Preaching here at the TIU campus, hosted by TEDS each year. This is the 42nd, uh, this endowed lectureship. Each year's topic focuses on some aspect of preaching in the life of the church. Now, I want to cover a few logistics on the front end before I fully introduce our speaker. Uh, we have a few things going on today. We have, obviously, the, the service now and a message now, and that can be... Uh, stream for those of you already watching. Uh, this is the medium for that. We have uh, lunch in Hinkson afterward, as was described. Grab a bag lunch, take a seat, and after a few minutes of you being able to socialize together, we'll get into a Q&A session with our speaker. The theme for the two uh, chapels today uh, is this idea of rooted and branching out, living into the biblical story. And as each of these is covered, the song of our life today, and then tomorrow in the college chapter, Wisdom for Life, uh, the college chapel, excuse me, Wisdom for Life, both also streamed. Uh, we're excited to hear Dr. Lee unpack these themes for us, these titles for us, this message for us. We really appreciate it. It's kind of a return back to, uh, for you, which is what we'll talk about in a, in a moment here. Uh, later today, I also wanted to make sure everyone knew, and I think we had the slide up earlier, there's a Zoom link. It's different than our normal streaming, but for the coffee at 4 o'clock, women involved in roles in preaching and teaching on faculty are welcome to join in the coffee. Many can't be uh, present. Uh, it'll be, again, in Hinkson, but you can join at the link. So take a shot of that or find a way to make sure you know that link so you can join in with us for that as well. Well, as a third culture kid born in South Korea, raised in Japan, and educated in an American international school, Dr. Lee's unique background and experience enrich her understanding and passion for preaching in the global church context. She holds a BA in psychology from Wheaton College and MDiv from Trinity, right here in our midst, and a PhD in theology with a concentration in preaching and the arts from Fuller Theological Seminary. From 2015 until recently, Lee was assistant professor of preaching at Fuller, and in July of 2021, she accepted the role of chief strategy officer at Resource Global, a Christian nonprofit that teaches, mentors, and connects emerging Christian marketplace leaders around the world so that they can use their resources and influence to multiply gospel impact and advance human flourishing across all sectors of society. Prior to teaching at Fuller, Lee served in church leadership and pastoral roles in the Chicago area. She has over 15 years of diverse ministry experience, which includes preaching, directing, translating, and teaching around the world. Today, she remains an active preacher and speaker worldwide. Lee's the author of Preaching God's Grand Drama, a Biblical Theological Approach, Baker Press, 2019 which presents a unifying third way in homiletical approaches that reimagines the preacher's role in relation to the Bible, the congregation, and the world. Her current research focuses on the theology and preaching of the Greek doctors of the church, with a working title of Greek Fathers and Rediscovering the Sacred Office of the Pastor by Fortress Press, forthcoming. She has contributed essays, reviews, and sermons to academic and popular journals. Her research interests include preaching and theology, hermeneutics, worship, and spiritual formation. She is a member of the Academy of Homiletics and the Society of Biblical Literature. Dr. Lee is married to Ryan Lee, who's made the trip with her here. The two met in college, and they live in the greater uh, Pasadena, California area. And we want to welcome our first woman speaker at the ROM Lectures in the 42nd year, Dr. Ami Lee. Please welcome her. Thank you so much. I am absolutely delighted to be here today. I'm grateful to Dr. Steve Roy, who first contacted me two years ago, actually, to invite me to be here today. My thanks also go to Dr. Bill Donahue and the Pastoral Theology Department for being such gracious hosts. 
I'm grateful to uh, President Nicholas Perrin and to the esteemed faculty and students of TEDS for so warmly welcoming me and for granting me this opportunity to serve my alma mater. My husband and my older brother are also graduates of TEDS, so this community is truly dear to our hearts. I'm honored to be here today, uh, but it is, I confess, a little strange and humbling to stand before my great teachers who profoundly shaped me during my MDiv many years ago at TEDS. Um, thank you so much for everything you have taught me and modeled, um, instilling in me especially deep love for God and his word. I'm particularly honored to be the first woman, as Dr. Donahue mentioned, a woman of color no less, to serve as the Ram lecturer. Your choice to invite me as the 42nd Ram lecturer is no small expression of your courage, hospitality, and love. And I am excited about many more women preachers who will be standing at this pulpit in the future preaching. So thank you for this invitation. Now in one spirit and mind, will you join me in asking for God's help and blessing as we turn to his word? Lord, no one is worthy of your word, but we come before you hungry and longing to be filled by you. We know that you won't turn us away because you are a covenantal God who is merciful, kind, and fiercely loving. Satisfy our hunger with your word so that we may go out declaring your praises to the world. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I don't sing like I used to. Though never a gifted singer, as a young child, I would belt out a happy song for all kinds of reasons, such as it being a particularly sunny morning or on finding my favorite food being served for dinner. My childhood was far from perfect, but in my innocence, I saw plenty of surprises, beauty, and reasons to be glad and hopeful. Yet I, as I grow older, I think I'm forgetting how to sing. Sure, I can use my vocal cords to carry a tune, but I'm not talking so much about using my voice to make sound as about singing as a means to let joy and gladness have their way and filling me up from within and manifesting into an outward expression of gratitude, exaltation, exhilaration. It's not that I've become emotionless, but that I've discovered there's just so much trouble and bad news in the world. Genuine heartfelt joy and gladness are quite rare these days, don't you think? They are buried deep somewhere in the chaos and mess of our lives. And I expect I'm not alone in what I'm feeling today. Look at all that's going on around the world. We're still dealing with a global pandemic almost two years out uh, after our first lockdown. Over four and a half million lives have been lost and many more people remain in dire need of vaccines and urgent medical help. The stabbing pain of losing loved ones, jobs, homes, and a sense of community is still palpable even as we desperately try to piece back our lives in hopes of feeling normal again. Our nation faces overwhelming political, racial, economic, and ecological challenges. Chaos of wars, ravaging violence, and evil are rampant. Unprecedented numbers of hurricanes, earthquakes, floods, wildfires, and other natural and human-made disasters have devastated countless lives on the earth. And in all this, we just can't ignore the fact that a disproportionate number of poor and disadvantaged persons particularly women and children, are the ones suffering because of the relentless waves of these crises. What about your personal lives? Some of you are battling physical illnesses. Some of you live with mental and emotional illnesses. All of us are juggling a broken or strained relationship or two. We are all plagued by anxiety and fear. We are exhausted from the endless challenges and pain that life brings on to us. So it's not that we don't know how to sing or that we don't care to sing. I'd in fact imagine that most of us long to sing with abandon. But whenever a song begins to rise in us, the worries, sorrows, and burdens that overwhelm us choke it and force it back down. 
The world pummels us with horrors. It has a way of sucking light and life from us. So how can we sing? It feels inappropriate to sing when people are weeping in agony. Children are crying in fear and hunger. And creation is groaning, doesn't it? Singing feels like minimizing the anguish and sorrow that we experience daily. It feels like the wrong response to the reality of pain and brokenness in and all around us. Or is it? The gospel text this morning shows Mary singing in a similarly improbable situation. It's interesting that the Bible overflows with singing. The Bible recounts God joyfully sings over his people in Zephaniah 317. And modeling themselves on this God, his people are certainly portrayed as a singing bunch. Think of Miriam singing, dancing, and leading praise after the Israelites crossed the Red Sea. Remember Jehoshaphat's army that witnessed God defeating multitudes of enemies as singers in the front line praised God. And picture Paul and Silas singing to God in prison. Remember the psalmist's repeated refrain, sing to God, sing praises to him, praise the Lord, hallelujah. And don't forget the vision in Revelation of all created things singing in unison, Blessing and honor and glory and power belong to the one sitting on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. Page after page, the Bible shows that singing, praising, exalting God is what his people do. Exalting God is powerful. Singing bridges the past, present, and the future. Singing helps us remember that, remember God's past faithfulness, participate in God's present and live into the future of Christ's perfect reign. We have an astonishing passage from Luke's gospel today. It's one of the first portraits of a Christian disciple that Luke offers in his gospel account. But it's noteworthy that the, God, that the disciple we encounter today is none other than an unassuming teenager doing something so incredibly ordinary, singing. After an angel informs Mary that she will miraculously conceive the Son of God who will establish his everlasting kingdom, Mary visits her relative Elizabeth, who is six months pregnant with John the Baptist. At that time, Elizabeth pronounces a benediction over Mary and the baby Jesus in her womb. And our text today is Mary's response to Elizabeth, in which she praises God's faithfulness to her, to the people of Israel, and to all who fear God. Now, I don't know for sure if there was a melody that accompanied Mary's words. We know that Mary's song, also referred to as the Magnificat, is crucial to Luke's account because it encapsulates the good news of Jesus' upside-down kingdom on which Luke reports. In fact, the short text is so important that Luke slows down the narrative pace and clears the stage for all eyes to be on Mary, an example of a true disciple who opens herself up to God's great story and joyfully gives her all to participate in it. But Luke wouldn't be happy if all we understood about this text was Mary's state of mind. We mustn't overlook the incredible portrait of God that Luke paints for us in this text. Mary's words point to the beautiful and truly faithful one who supplies the faith, gladness, and hope that enable us to sing. So with great expectation, let's listen to God's word. Our scripture reading today is from Luke chapter 1, verses 46 through 55. That's Luke chapter 1, verses 46 through 55. Please follow along as I read in the ESV. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things. And the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his offspring forever. This is the word of the Lord. 
Thanks be to God. My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. Even though she doesn't fully comprehend God's ways or knows what lies ahead, Mary, a faithful disciple, praises the Lord, who is the rightful master of her life. Not Caesar, who was the Lord and Savior in appearance, but mercilessly subjected people to Rome's rule. Not Herod, a tyrant who ruled with irrationality and fear. Mary doesn't bow down to the deceptive power of social status or acceptance. Her master isn't prestige or privilege. Even though the ground beneath her is shaking and she is bracing for the inevitable social shame and losses that come with being found to be pregnant out of wedlock, even so Mary is rooted in her faith that the Lord of heaven and earth is sovereign. He has the power and authority over all dominions. He is unchanging and steadfast. His knowledge has no limit. He is the source and sustainer of life, a ruler who makes no mistakes. It is out of this rootedness that she releases her power and ownership of her life and places them before the sovereign Lord. And this Lord isn't a distant, heartless ruler, a Caesar or a Herod. No, he is her savior. For she is secure in the knowledge that God's purposes are always to save, sustain, preserve, and prosper those whom he loves, even when things appear otherwise. Mary's peace and joy are deeply grounded in the knowledge that her savior is loving, generous, kind, and good. My brothers and sisters, if faith is an enduring ability to see God for who he is, despite Despite what life throws at us, how is your faith doing today? Who is God to you these days? Despite everything that's happened these past two years, do you still trust God, who is the sovereign Lord and your Savior? Is he still your exceeding joy? I wonder whether our inability to sing these days has something to do with our inability to see God clearly for who he is. But I believe that God wants to remind us today of who he is, that he is true Lord and Savior, not only by title, but also in reality. In this text, we certainly see an example of a faithful disciple in Mary. But more importantly, we glimpse a portrait of God who is faithful. Notice that God intervenes and acts decisively on Mary's behalf to make his salvation real and material to her. Listen to Mary's reasons for praise in verses 48 and 49. Because God has looked on the humble estate of his servant, because he who is mighty has done great things for me. Mary has no social status or family background worth noting. Luke simply introduces her in the preceding passage as a resident of a small agricultural village named called Nazareth, a virgin engaged to a man named Joseph from the house of David. Her existence is insignificant and inconsequential in a merciless empire ruled by the most privileged, the strongest, and the wealthiest who prey on others to enhance their wealth and position. She is a Jewish peasant girl, an outsider in her society, a person low on the social ladder. Her existence is invisible and forgettable to others in her society. But the good news of the Bible is that God is holy and unlike any other. So he does what no one else cares to do or can do. God takes notice of Mary, shows her concern and kindness, and reverses her fortunes. Just as God's mercy and goodness moved him to rescue the enslaved Israelites from Egypt, so now God has compassion on Mary, moves in, and acts on her behalf. And it's no wonder then that Mary jubilantly exclaims, For behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. All of us here are witnesses to God's blessing on Mary that's still being fulfilled today. Generations after her, we still call Mary blessed because of what God has done for her, and more importantly, through her, by bringing into the world a Savior who will rescue and redeem the nations. What an incredible honor. 
The world despised Mary's low social status, but God looked on her with favor and crowned her with glory. What a turnaround that an expendable servant in the eyes of the Lord is dignified and honored as the servant of the Lord in the tradition of Abraham, Moses, Joshua, Hannah, David, and the Old Testament prophets. Who would have it thought that Mary's lowliness, her very shame, her greatest shame, would become her badge of honor? Who would have imagined that a poor peasant girl would have something so rich and beautiful to sing about that the whole world would listen? As a Jewish girl since birth, Mary must have heard thousands of stories about Israel's covenantal God. But when she encounters this holy God personally, she realizes that he really is a promise keeper. God breaks into her reality, makes her part of his unfolding story of cosmic redemption. The long-awaited Messiah is coming, and God is accomplishing his plan through her. In this moment of recognition, I imagine that Mary finally recognized the old truth known by Noah, Rachel, and her ancestors, that this is a God who remembers. In that experience of unexpected grace, Hagar's wilderness confession becomes Mary's own. You are a God of seeing. Truly, I have seen him who looks after me. The psalmist's ancient hymn becomes transformed into Mary's present praise. What are human beings that you think about them? What are human beings that you pay attention to them? In this amazing moment, Mary experiences Hannah's delight in God for attending to her barrenness and giving her Samuel. Remember Hannah's song? There is none holy like the Lord. There is none besides him. There is no rock like our God. Long after her ancestors had gone, Mary realizes that God is still active, turning people's mourning into dancing, loosening their sackcloth, and clothing his people with gladness. This is who God is. As the name itself reveals, Israel is a people seeing God. But it was God who saw Israel first and revealed himself to them. God was the gracious initiator, the compassionate, benevolent one, protecting his people from enemies and even from themselves at times. And this living God is now weaving Mary's story and Israel's story together into a beautiful tapestry of his great drama that was bigger than life. Friends, you might feel like you have no song to sing. Your heart is parched and your mouth is dry. But I invite you today to gaze at this beautiful God who put a new song in the mouths of Mary and countless others. Remember that the same God is reigning and sustaining your life at this moment. Recall his mercy and protection, how he has sheltered you under his wings, provided for your needs, defended and comforted you in the valleys, and prospered you to this point. As the beloved hymn invites us, friends, ponder anew what the Almighty can do if with his love he befriends you. Because the Bible tells us that this God has come to us in flesh to dwell with us, and to befriend sinners. And I think this is the amazing news of the gospel that we celebrate and the God we worship. But there is more, there is more to this good news. If you think Mary's testimony is amazing, there is even greater news for us in verse 50. Look again with me. And God's mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. Mary is not the sole beneficiary of God's mercy and power. All God-fearers, all those who follow Mary's example and acknowledge and align themselves with God's rightful lordship are also recipients of his mercy. In other words, you and I are included in the story of God fulfilling the promise to bless all nations through Abraham's seed. God's plan starts with his servant and representative, Israel, and fans out to all the nations. He will fully establish his just and righteous kingdom one day and include it in the proclamation that God will be merciful and defend those who fear him then is the joyful climax of Mary's song, a breathtaking picture of God who enacts real change 
in the real world. Hear again Mary's words. Verse 51. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring forever. These descriptions elicit images of God's past deeds for example, we remember God's strong hand and an outstretched arm that defended the powerless Israel against Pharaoh's massive army. We remember that God scattered those who relied on their own capacity and tribalism and sought a name for themselves at Babel. We also recall stories of kings and rulers like Saul who were humbled by God's hands. But we also know that the same hands that humble the arrogant also raise up the lowly like David. There are countless stories, poems, images in the Old Testament of God who satisfies the hungry and lavishly provides for the poor. However, these descriptions of Mary's song are not simply limited to the past. They are also prophetic. These words are a foretaste of the glorious finale to God's story. God's kingdom, which was established with Christ's first coming, will physically manifest on earth in its full glory when Jesus returns to consummate his promise. Until that day, God continues to subvert and correct distortions of power and restore order in this world. And Mary's proclamation assures us of God's present work and our future reality, the future glory. And at the same time, it invites those who revere God to join Mary's praise now, today. Of course, in the here and now, our reality feels like a stark contrast to the depiction of God's perfect reign in these verses. Look at the violence and agony in the Middle East, especially in Afghanistan. See the horrifying casualties of wars, poverty, and unimaginable injustices as the proud and mighty terrorize and the weak, poor, and hungry suffer. Look at the unceasing armed conflicts and their devastating effect in sub-Saharan Africa. We remember the countless children, the injured persons, refugees, asylum seekers, and others trapped in an unsafe environment where their basic needs aren't even met. How can we forget the corruption, inequality, and the widespread economic devastation exacerbated by COVID-19 in South America? Or what about the disparity between the wealthy and the poor, the ongoing discrimination of women, the escalating tensions between countries, and the sweeping political unrest in Asia? Closer to home, our hearts are heavy because of the never-ending gun violence in Chicago and the at-risk communities that live daily in fear and disappointment over failed policies and promises. We see systemic racism, segregation, poverty, and educational gaps that perpetuate socioeconomic disparities, trauma, and death right here in this state. Injustice is everywhere. The world is broken and suffering. There is real work that the church is called to do by joining God's initiatives. And at the same time, we must not forget God's continuing presence and goodness in this world. God is actively working toward the future he has promised. Think of your own life. You bear witness to God's kindness and mercy. So much has happened these past two years I'm sure you had moments when you weren't sure if you were going to make it, but here you are. Maybe you feel that the pandemic or other tragedy in your life has taken a piece of you that you feel like you'll never get back. And if so, I am so sorry for the pain that you're having to endure. But I hope you can see today that God has brought you to this point. God has sustained you. Look at those around you in this room. No one is free from pain and trouble, but the people in this community are a reminder of God's continuing faithfulness to his people. Look at the global church. Even though the night seems to be getting darker, millions are coming to the light that is Christ. Some through the word of mouth, some miraculously through visions and dreams, some through the gift of technology. 
despite unimaginable persecution and hardships. We must also remember brothers and sisters in North Korea, India, Nigeria, Afghanistan, Libya, and other places whose genuine faith shines brighter in the testing of fire and inspiring the rest of the church. There are missionaries who will tell you that although things are not easy, God has provided for their needs and protected them from danger and harm, even against all odds. And everyday Christ followers in diverse sectors of society are bearing public witness to Christ in their life and work. They are bringing tangible help to the poor, freedom to the oppressed, joy and gladness to those grieving, and life is incredibly fragile. The church is flawed and we're not perfect. But God is at work fulfilling his promise to bless all nations. Evidence of God's presence is all around us. Yet even as we celebrate who God is and what he's continuing to do today to fulfill his promise to Abraham, I believe this text invites us to go one step deeper and consider just one more thing. We love the good news that Mary's blessing can be ours, and this is also where things can get complicated and uncomfortable for us. Mary's song is both encouraging and unsettling to me. On one hand, I identify with the lowly in this text. I am a child of a broken home, a woman of color, a third culture kid who feels perpetually rootless, an immigrant to this country, someone who understands being in the margins. I rejoice in God who notices me, shows me kindness and mercy, and overturns the world's expectations and conventions by showcasing his power through someone like me. On the other hand, the words in the final verses disturb me because the truth is, in a way, I am the proud, the mighty, and the rich. I can't deny the obvious privileges and blessings I do enjoy from my background to education and the opportunities given me. I have access to so much and I can't fully identify with those who know mostly suffering, despair, and unbelonging. I contribute to and perpetuate both directly and indirectly an unjust world that God in this text seems so keen on dismantling and repairing. I am complicit when I turn a deaf ear to the cries of the poor, marginalized and oppressed, and convince myself that the gospel is simply a matter of personal salvation. I regard myself as beyond any ideology and partisan beliefs when I make calculated allegiances that benefit my interests. I often use my voice for comfort and gain rather than standing with God and those about whom he cares. But the God who appears in this text appears to operate with an entirely different set of values than the world. He sees and honors people whom we regularly discount, sidestep, and forget. He resists our tendency to truncate theology by showing that his salvation is not an abstract or private matter, but is overwhelmingly physical and public. This is the gospel and the upside-down way of Jesus the Messiah to which both this text and Luke's account bear witness. The prevailing of God's kingdom characterized by mercy, truth, enabling power, and justice. Mary's song calls us to live into Christ's kingdom and story by being firmly rooted in God's past faithfulness and branching out to the nations into the future that God has promised and will bring to pass. It calls us to follow the Holy Spirit's lead and participate in God's work to restore the glory and dominion of our true Lord and Savior in the world. But that's not all. This passage is also a litmus test for us. Does Mary's song make you uncomfortable? Does God who appears in this text threaten or unsettle your understanding of power? Is God confronting and unsettling you about your values, perception of neighbors, and even the gospel? Are you and I willing to join wholeheartedly in Mary's song? Or are we so disturbed and offended by the Father's scandalous grace that we would rather sit out this song and skip the celebration? You see, Mary's song isn't just about God's past and future. It also speaks to our moment right now and to the choices we must make because of who God is. 
Now, there's a lot we can do to participate in God's ongoing story. But for now, let's focus on one essential task of faithful disciples, exalting God for who he is. Friends, there is nothing escapist, passive, or neutral about singing like Mary. Praising God is not blind optimism that shrinks back from the world. Exalting God for who he is and what he's doing is a radical declaration of faith and resistance against the world that tries to hijack the anthem of God's kingdom. Mary's song is like a battle cry. It invokes the power and authority of our Lord and Savior to remind us of who we are. It fuels God-fearing people with hope and joy in our battle against the rulers, the authorities, the cosmic power over the present darkness and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. So sing. Sing like your life depends on it. Sing to remind yourself and others of God's faithfulness when despair tries to take over. Sing. Sing knowing that it is the fitting response of faithful disciples who grasp that their lives are lived within God's great story of redemption that extends from Israel to the world. The world is broken and suffering. It needs to hear the church sing about our magnificent God who will right all wrong and reign in peace and justice. Tears and heartaches are an inv inevitable part of our life on earth. But even as we grieve this reality, let Mary's song lift your spirit and infuse you with fresh courage and gladness in these dark days, reminding you that God is not done with the world he loves. Let your God be your song when the going gets tough. And follow Mary's lead and join the song of the saints who across time and space have tasted God's goodness. Magnify the Lord's mercy and power by proclaiming to yourself and to the world the night and day difference God made for you. From nothing to something, from rejected to accepted. Boast in the Lord and let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Because the night may feel dark and long, but one fine morning... The whole earth will be clothed in beauty and glory that we didn't merit. And our song will join this glorious symphony of heaven's praise when Jesus finally returns as the king. When Christ shall come with shouts of acclamation and take us home, what joy shall fill our hearts. Then we shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim, my God, how great thou art. Won't you join God's faithful disciples through the ages in singing, our God, how great thou art. Sing, sing of God's greatness. This is the song of our life in Christ. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. God, be our song in the valley. Magnify yourself through the praises of your people so that the world may come to know you and share in our joy. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Lee, uh, for your words and um, your reminder of, of God's gift of song that we have. So would you stand and would you join us in responding as we remember uh, the joy and the hope and the salvation that we have in Christ alone. Christ 
Christ alone Who took on flesh Fullness of God in helpless babe This gift of love and righteousness Scorned by the ones he came to save Till on that cross as Jesus died the wrath of God was satisfied For every sin on Him was laid Here in the death of Christ I live There ground his body lay light of the world by darkness slain then bursting forth in glorious day up from the grave he rose again and as he stands in victory since curse has lost Pray together. Loving and gracious Father, we thank you for the gift of your word that testifies to the saving power of the life giving word made flesh. We thank you also for the gift of preaching and for those who labor in your word week by week so that your people around the world might know you better and so that those who, who don't know you might come to know you. Grant that we might nurture and sustain a holy curiosity about everything that has to do with your word so that we may faithfully declare the excellencies of the one who called us out of darkness and into marvelous light. Grant that we may not simply know that the light shines in the darkness, but that we may grow in our ability to discern how it shines in the darkness. Grant that we may eschew manipulation, but work hard at illustration. Grant that we may delight in the exaltation of, our, of Christ and not the exaltation of ourselves. Praise for Christ and not praise for our sermons. Grant that we may never preach your word without first coming under your word. 
we come before you today as people beset by frailty and weakness, as people who often feel overwhelmed and who lament that there are not enough hours in a day or even days in a life to do all that we would want to do or all that we think that we should do. Help us to see that our basic needs of sleep and food and health are reminders that our lives are in your hands and that the life that we live, we live by faith in the Son of God. As we come to the midpoint of this semester and feel the weight of all that remains to be done, we ask that you renew our strength. May we be quick to give thanks and slow to complain. May we be quick to listen and slow to anger. May we, we be quick to encourage and slow to criticize. May we abound with the desires to do good to your people and look to you for the strength to fulfill them. We ask for your kindness and care for the community that you have gathered on this campus. Guard the physical health of those who live and work here. But guard our words as well and shape our hearts that all who pass this way may behold the glory of the risen Lord in lives shaped by your love and the power of your spirit. We ask these things for Christ's sake. Amen. Now receive this benediction. Now the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. Amen. Go in peace.